A Woman's Response to The Rational Male by Rolo Tomasi. We're here. Yay. Last chapter. We made it through the whole book. This is, oh, hello. This is cool. This is weird. It is going to be very, very weird two weeks from now after doing the big uh, question um, question and answer kind of video that I'm doing uh, next week. So the week after that, it'll be weird doing a new book. It's going to be strange. Um, it's going to be the mystery method. So that's going to be, it's going to be cool. But it, I'm, I'm, I'm going to miss this thing. Like this thing has been following me everywhere. It's been sitting with me in the car when I like take my kids to school. But um, this, are you purring? Like, excuse me, excuse me, sir. You're, um, yeah. So um, this week's chapter is the feminine imperative. And I was really excited about this. I was like, yay, grand finale. Let's see how he finishes up the book. And, and you know, I can't wait to talk about this. And I read the chapter, reread the chapter. And um, I really felt like something was missing. And I wanted to talk about that. And Tomasi does a really good job of, of he, he's, he makes a lot of good points. Um, and he goes in and he lays out this idea that, you know, the feminine imperative is, is many, many individuals who are all working in their own self-interest. It's not some giant overarching umbrella of evil that's like dictating men's lives and destroying things. It's lots and lots of individuals who are all working selfishly and slowly corroding the structure of our society. Um... And that sounds like feminism to me. It's like lots and lots of people who are well-meaning and a few people who are definitely not well-meaning all working together to create this thing that they think is going to be utopia that doesn't seem remotely healthy, but that's what they think. Um, but I think there are some things... I don't know. There are some things that I thought about as I was reading this chapter that I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit. Um, first of all, Tomasi at one point mentions, and I'll try to get the quote up here, the idea that men are disposable is part of the feminine imperative. And I don't think that's true. Like, I know feminists think men are disposable and I think that's horrible. And I think that one of the problems with society is that women think, women as individuals think that men are disposable. So they'll, they'll get together with a man, but they won't see him as being truly as valuable as he is, um, which is, is not good. Um, it's not good for the men and it's really not good for the women. Like if you want to have a healthy relationship as a woman in this day and age, you really need to value your man for everything that he is. Um, and society does not really encourage that of women at this point, And I think it's very unhealthy. From the macro dynamics of divorce laws and legal definitions of rape to gender bias in military conscription, drafting only men to die in war, and down to the smallest details of mundane water cooler talk in the workplace, I began to realize just how overwhelming this influence is on our existences. So I don't think that the disposability of men, as Tomasi talks about it, is necessarily a feminine serving thing. I think it's a society serving thing. I think those things are, are those two things are different. And the reason I think that, um, this last week, I had an interesting conversation with someone in the comments section who was telling me that I should prepare my daughters to live in a future where society had become polygamous and they would be in harems with 50 other women and that would be the kind of world that they would live in. And um, it was really, really laughable and it was really, really obviously not accurate. But uh, this guy was insisting that that was the way things are going to work out. And... Um, I had been, I had been reading, at, ironically at the same time, I had been reading this article on whether or not humans are monogamous by nature or polygynous by nature, polygamous by nature, um, specifically polygynous. There are occasionally cultures that are polyandrous, but not so much of a thing. Generally, cultures throughout the world are either monogamous or polygynous. And a lot of people, I guess, according to this article, I'm going to leave a link in the description. Um, a lot of people are, you know, always assumed that humans are monogamous. And I always assumed humans are naturally monogamous. That's just how we are. That's how we're programmed. 
yeah, men will spend a little bit of time being a little bit polygynous when they're young. They'll date around. They'll have sex with lots of women. They'll sow their wild oats. But um, really, ultimately, humans are monogamous. And that wasn't entirely correct. So what they did, it was a Psychology Today article. They, were, they went through and they looked at human physical, you know, biology. And they tried to identify all the markers that indicated either a, a, polygam, a polygamous um, history, biological history, or a monogamous biological history. And it was fascinating. And so it's totally worth a read. But ultimately, they concluded that instead of one man having 50 wives, which does happen, but it's not a very common occurrence. Like, let's face it. Usually that dude has to be pretty rich, pretty wealthy, pretty lucky. Um... Most men do not keep 50 wives, even in polygamous societies. Um, what they found, biologically speaking, is the humans are just slightly tilted out of monogamy and into polygyny. Um, and so the way they wrote it in the article, which I thought was rather amusing, is every man is basically designed to have 1.5 wives. <laughs> and so it's like you can... You can maybe squeeze in a mistress on the side, but generally speaking, every guy's going to pretty well have one solid wife. Um, which is interesting. Um, I don't think monogamy and the, the, the predisposition toward monogamy that society is structured around us is feminine serving. I think it's society serving. I think I think that an argue can, an argument can be made for that because we have seen the differences between polygamous societies and monogamous societies. You know, we've been able to observe that throughout history, we've been able to observe it, you know, even in the current day throughout the world. In a monogamous society, people are more cooperative. And my husband and I, we can we we can tell you about this firsthand because we've experienced it ourselves. My husband, he went out, he found a mate. And once he had a mate, that was it. He was done looking for a mate. He had successfully done that thing. In a monogamous society, the man goes out, he's young, he's restless, he's full of testosterone, he seeks a mate. He's a little bit more aggressive, you know, really trying to assert himself, assert his dominance and then obtain the highest status the highest ranking mate that he can attain um but then he's done he's done with that part he's got his mate she gets pregnant she produces some offspring now he's got offspring and suddenly his job is not going out and seeking mates in a monogamous society it is inserting his offspring into the society so that they can grow up and be healthy and successful and seek out their own mates and so you know my, my husband and I have experienced this we you know, I'm, I'm very, very introverted, incredibly introverted. Um, but, uh, I've been trying to go out into society and really ingrain myself into the society around me so that my children can socialize so that they can play with other kids so that they can, you know, grow up and be less introverted than their mother. Um, that's, that's what happens in a monogamous society. My husband is very, cooperative with other males and I'm you know well I, I just follow my husband's lead let's face it but <laughs> he's very cooperative with other males and the reason is because he has a mate and his co-worker has a mate and his other co-worker has a mate and everybody has their own mate and everybody has a mate and so they're all decently satisfied with a mate and then their goal becomes not seeking out and obtaining a mate, which is a very aggressive and, and, and searching kind of activity. It becomes settling down in one spot and building stuff and cooperating with the other members of society and creating a, a, a safe place to raise and tend to offspring. Um, which you could say is a feminine goal, but really it's, it's a societal goal. Monogamous societies are more productive because everybody can work together as a unit, everybody can cooperate as a team, and there's much less interpersonal conflict. Once you obtain a mate, your job seeking out a mate has more or less ended. Successfully, you don't have to worry about that job anymore. And so you can move your mind on to higher things. 
in a polygamous society, specifically a polygynous society, um, in contrast, men are grabbing up women all the time. Like, uh, you know, you're constantly on the, on the, on the prowl for a new woman because you have a wife, but you could always take another wife. And after those two wives, you could technically take another wife if you can afford it. Um, and men have to compete with other men for wives because there are only so many women to go around. And so you're grabbing up all the women that you can keep and you're keeping all the other men away. So you're mate guarding like mad, you're grabbing up women. Um, it's very, it's very aggressive. You don't have time or energy to invest in, in higher aspirations. You can't build huge architectural wonders and masterpieces. It's not that you it's not that it never happens, but it's much more difficult to achieve because you're grabbing up all the mates. And if you're going to be successful biologically, you have to grab up all the mates. It produces, as a byproduct, an unfortunate byproduct, a, a subclass of aggressive, frustrated, military-age men who cannot, def- who cannot obtain mates of their own, who need to do something to obtain mates to to keep themselves from becoming biologically obsolete and they can do that by stealing women from men who have mates or going to some other area and stealing women from there or you know wars wars happen a lot you know wars are a great way to throw away all your excess men um the The disposability of men is not a feminine serving thing. It's a society serving thing. It's a, it's a social byproduct, um, primarily of, primarily of polygyny, but also occasionally monogamous societies. Um, it's, it's something that concerns me because I look at our society as it now stands and I see you know, the, the insul subculture, this, this group of men who can't find mates. And it's like, okay, why can't you find mates? Are we as a culture adopting more polygynous habits? And if we are, that's not healthy for the culture. The disposability of men is not a healthy thing that you see in cultures. It's something you see in cultures that are tilting in a polygynous, such, uh, in a polygynous direction. And you know, that's not good. Um, which is not to say that monogamous cultures don't have certain, a certain degree of disposability for men. Um, but it's, it's much more pronounced in a polygynous society. So, so I do wonder about our culture. I do wonder what the hell we're doing in the dating market. Like, and also, I mean, we've got, we've got a huge number of women who aren't finding mates either. So, you know, clearly there are a few things that are pretty wonky out there. Um, but I, I think the tendency to view men as disposable is, number one, it's a, it's a feminism thing. I think that's just an unhealthy feminist idea that needs to go. But, you know. but also, um, I do think that part of it, like when it comes to the military, for example, um, I think that just makes sense. Women... <laughs> I I have not met many women in my life, if I have met any women in my life at all, who have been particularly well-suited for combat. Um, I... I've seen some messed up things in my life, and I've known some other women who've seen some really messed up things in their lives. I've seen some people who've survived some really horrific situations, uh, accidents, you know, things that go wrong. And they're tough. They're really tough. But I've known a lot of military dudes too. They're tougher. So I do look at women and just their overall physical and psychological makeup and wonder, you know, do you really, really want that on the battlefield? And I I think when it comes to society with the disposability of men, I think it's sometimes more society serving. Like, once you get married, once you settle down, suddenly you become much more, much more cooperative, much more community oriented. You know, what goes on out there affects my kids. And so suddenly I need to be involved in what goes on out there to create a better place for my offspring. 
because I don't need to go out hunting a mate anymore. And that's me. I'm a woman. So that would naturally be my response. But it's also his. He no longer needs to seek out a mate. He's produced, you know, a decent amount of offspring. <laughs> Hopefully we can get one more in there. Um, but yeah, it changes, it changes your attitude. And I wonder sometimes, you know, people aren't getting married. Um, you know, what, what's going on with the society? Is that necessarily feminine goals that are being served? For one gender to realize their sexual imperative, the other must sacrifice their own. This is the root source of power the feminine imperative uses to establish its own reality as the normative one. Again, I kind of go back to that polygynous um, versus monogamous kind of biological makeup. The majority of men can really only afford to take one wife, maybe squeeze in an extra one somewhere. I don't think that it it serves a feminine goal so much as an overarching societal goal for the structure of the society to stand. Um, these are the sacrifices that men need to make. And if they don't make those sacrifices, the structure of the society will be altered dramatically and probably not for the best. The wall and what it's like to go through the epiphany phase and hitting the wall when you're already married. One of the things that men have suggested to me in the comments section has been that I followed the same pattern that all these other women that Tomasi talks about have followed. Um, I just hit my epiphany stage early and that's what it was. So I did the same thing all the other girls did. I, I went out and I partied and I rode the cock carousel and then for some bizarre reason, possibly something to do with me being a stripper, I hit my epiphany stage super duper really early and then I settled for some beta chump and that's the reason I'm married right now. And that's that's how they've explained it to me many times. Um, and they're wrong, but uh, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. Um, I did not hit an epiphany. Well, first of all, I didn't really ride a cock carousel like a lot of people think that because I was a stripper and because I was meeting many, many men that I was like having sex with many men because that would just follow, follow logically. And it's like, mm, no, no, not really. I, I found it to be pretty, it, it's not particularly thrilling to have sex with someone you're not particularly attracted to. And the majority, the vast majority of men were unattractive to me. So it was like, well, you know, it's a, it's a mechanical action at that point. Do you really want to have boring mechanical sex with somebody? And it's like, as a woman, that's not something that really appeals. So I didn't have as many partners as I think a lot of these guys think I have. And a lot of guys have told me they're sure that I've got, I think one guy said a huge body count. <laughs> um, that's not necessarily the case, but, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't ride the cock carousel and I didn't, I didn't hit the epiphany stage particularly early either because I remember hitting the wall, the epiphany stage eh, around 30. <laughs> I'd been married to my husband for a good while by that point. And, um, I remember like just a collection of little teeny moments that I've had in my life where I can see, you know, oh gee, I'm not as young as I used to be. Oh gee, I'm not as sexy as I used to be. Oh gosh, I'm not as pretty as I used to be. Um, I remember one time I put on makeup and I hadn't worn makeup in a, over a year, probably more than one year. And I put it on and I looked at myself in the mirror and maybe it was just the lighting, but I was like, God, I look so old. <laughs> Like, I just don't look as good as I used to. Like, God, did I used to look... I was sure once upon a time I used to look hot. And this this does not look good. I had to take the makeup off because I was like, this is just highlighting everything that's wrong with my face right now. Um, <laughs> I had a lot of moments like that. And I had them at roughly the age of 30. I did not marry my husband because I needed someone to provide for me or take care of me. I didn't think of someone providing and taking care of me when I married my husband. I wanted a companion. I wanted someone to go through the adventures of life with. And life was a, a, a fascinating series of adventures that I wanted to, I wanted to not have to endure alone. 
what good is a uh, is a, is an amazing fantastic adventure if you if you go through the whole thing alone and there's nobody to share the beauty or the joy of it with what's the point if i'm the only one who sees a beautiful sunset isn't that sunset just a little bit wasted i can't necessarily communicate it to other people and it just seems so so much less if i'm the only person who enjoys it i mean there are those moments that you get to enjoy that are just yours and only yours but most of the time if I had the choice I'd prefer to have some company on my adventures and my husband was a fantastic person to have that companionship with you know an amazing exciting adventurous man to to accompany me through life and that was what I was thinking about and then I got pregnant and that was the first that was the first part of the epiphany stage. You know, I got pregnant. Um, I had the ectopic, so we lost the baby. I had to have abdominal surgery, which is not fun in case you've never had abdominal surgery. It's not fun. And um, I had to recover from all that. I was deeply depressed, like just horribly depressed. I was sad. I was very just broken up about it. and I, I honestly I needed somebody to take care of me. I was just shattered by that. My first pregnancy, and it was a horrible disaster, and I was completely broken. And and I had someone in my life who, who gave a shit about me, which was amazing. And so it's like, okay, you know, you, you kind of do need somebody to take care of you. That's not, that's not just some fairy tale that mom told me when I was a little girl. It's like, okay, you do actually need somebody who can take care of you sometimes. Because my mom used to tell me, you know, you can be all tough and strong and independent and, you know, feminist um, until you start getting pregnant and having babies. And then you really do need a solid, committed partner with you by your side to help you get through that because you will be vulnerable. And I remember I gave birth and boy, was I vulnerable. Um, boy, did I need someone to help me because I couldn't just take care of myself particularly easily. Um, you know, that first one was a little bit rocky, you know, (laughs) and, and I was very lucky because I had my husband, I had my in-laws who are fantastic. I had people in my life to help me just get through things. Like it was, it was rough, you know, it wasn't rough as in, oh my God, it was this horrible thing I had to endure. It's just, it's a huge transition having a baby, big change in your life, you know, um, that was that was an epiphany moment. That was one of those moments like, gee, I really do need a man to take care of me. You know, gee, I can't imagine going back to work at this point in time. Like, I wanted to go back to work. I loved my job. I wanted to go back to the club. I wanted to get back in shape. I wanted to have all those muscles again. I wanted to be, you know, doing super acrobatic things on a pole. I wanted all that, but I was in no shape to be going back to work right after I had a baby. Um... You know, I need someone to take care of me. So suddenly that provider aspect, I mean, it started emerging in about, you know, late, late 20s. We started having kids, especially, you know, as, as time passes and I'm going through more and more pregnancies and I had to retire from my job because we had two small, small babies in the house. And, you know, you can't be Wonder Woman. You have to, you have to pick and choose. Do you want to be a mom or do you want to go out and party? And it's like, well, obviously I want to be a mom. Um... You know, I needed, I needed that provider element and it was there, I think, because I found a very good man and that doesn't make him into some automatic beta. Like, oh, he was, he was alpha right up until this point. And then suddenly just magically one day, poof, he turned into a beta because suddenly my need for him altered or changed or shifted or evolved. Um, that's not how it works. He's still that hot, sexy alpha dude that I was dating back in my early twenties going, Oh my God, this guy is fantastic and exciting and fun. And we, isn't this wonderful. Um, but suddenly I had the epiphany, the, the realization that I need somebody to take care of me because, because I am physically very vulnerable and I have a, an extremely vulnerable infant and I need to invest everything that I have into taking care of this infant and I can't go out and face the outside world. 
you know, I can't, I can't go out and be all tough right now. I'm, I'm in no shape to do that. I'm in no condition to do that. So, you know, this idea that people have that I, you know, so for some reason I, at the age of like, what, 22, 23-ish, all of a sudden have this massive epiphany, like, oh, I need a guy to, I need a man to take care of me. Like, it's laughable. Um, bringing that back to the wall. You can't change biology. Like, it's, it's always laughable to me that women seek to do that. That they seek to change their biology. That they seek to make themselves sexier and hotter. That they seek to deny the effect that they can have on men. Um, you know, that it dwindles. Of course it dwindles. I'm not as sexy as I used to be. I know that. I'm ten years older than I was when I met my husband. The woman he met was a hell of a lot sexier than the woman who's sitting in front of you guys right now. Granted, that woman had not given him three healthy, beautiful, strong children in the peak of her prime. Um, I, I did that. I did that. So that's good. Um, but, uh, you know, I look at it and it's like, I try to be realistic about it. I try to hold on to my shape and my fitness and my strength. And I try to maintain my looks as much as possible because I want to look pretty for him for as long as I possibly can. I'm not going to look pretty for him the way I used to when I'm 60 years old. But, you know, I can look good for 30. I can look good for 40. I can look good for 50. I want to do that for him because I think he deserves it. You know, he's a good man. He deserves a hot wife. Or at least as hot of a wife as I can give him. Um, but yeah, the, the wall, the wall always makes me laugh. You know, I, I was a stripper. We know, we know, even if we pretend that it's not the case, even if we try to deny it, even if we try to fight it, I will never be as pretty as I was 10 years ago when I met my husband. It's not going to happen. It's just not. Women's greatest fear is that they could become the selected instead of the select ors. So going from that, let's bounce over to something fun. Let's talk about duck penises. Um, a male duck's penis. <laughs> you, know, you know I brought this up just because I want to talk about something goofy, but uh, a male duck's penis is a bizarre looking thing. You can look it up online. It's, it's corkscrew shaped and it explodes out of the male duck. It is a very bizarre looking thing. And the reason that that developed the way it did, like, you know, ducks didn't just magically wake up one day with explosive corkscrew penises. Um, it evolved that way because male ducks are very sexually aggressive towards females and females have evolved a bizarre corkscrew shaped vaginal canal to, to weed out any, but the strongest, you know, duck sperm that they happen to encounter. Um, which is not unusual for nature, nature, sexuality in, you know, pretty much all animals and humans as well is an arms race. Sexuality is an arms race. And I'm sure this is not an unusual concept for really any of you, but, um, but duck penises are fun to talk about. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I think when people say that sexuality, the sexual arena is a mar is a, uh, it's an arms race. I think they think it's men versus women and it is not nearly that simple. It's you as a man, if you're a man watching this, as an individual man versus all the men around you who are competing against you for the best mates versus women. It is every man and woman for him or herself. It is indi every individual enters the sexual arena for themselves fighting on their own team. You might form temporary alliances where you get friends and wingmen and, you know, they help you with your dating and, you know, you, you, you form alliances with people. That's where you are naturally social animals. Humans are naturally social. So you do, you do form alliances, but ultimately your goal is number one. That's the way that sex works. And people will say, oh no, 
it's not really the way it works. Women, for some crazy reason, I guess women sometimes think that they're not in the sexual marketplace for purely selfish reasons. And look, you're a human being, you walk on two feet, you know, maybe you don't have any feet, it doesn't matter. You're still going to be primarily driven by, you know, this, this need to find yourself the very best mate that you can. And so the thing that really struck me as I was reading this chapter and thinking, you know, something's not quite lining up for me here. I don't know. I don't know if this is an idea that was missing from the chapter or simply a different idea that kept on popping in my head as I was reading the chapter. But the thing that really struck me is not necessarily the feminine imperative or women imposing their will on men in order to manipulate men to have their own hypergamy optimized. The thing that struck me is everyone is out for themselves in the dating marketplace. Everyone is fighting their own battle to obtain their own goals in the dating marketplace. And what are they trying to obtain? Um, the best partner they can, the best sexual partners that they can obtain. For men, it might be multiple ideal sexual partners, but if you gave a man a choice between uh, multiple ugly women or multiple supermodels, you know, I think he'd choose the multiple supermodels. Women are the same way. Women want to mate with the best possible mate they can. Hypergamy, that's what it's all about. Everybody is out to get the very best deal that they can in the sexual marketplace. So when it's an arms race, who are you competing against? Other men, if you're a man. You're competing against other men, obviously. But you're also competing against women with low sexual market value because they're going to want you because you have higher sexual market value than they do. And so what, what are the two options that are available to a person who has a low sexual market value? And as a person who had a low sexual market value, I can answer this question. Um, the two primary options that I see, and I guess there's a third option, Kind of. And there might be more, but I, I really only see two. You can either improve yourself and become better and raise your sexual market value, which is uh, an option that is much more readily available to men than women in the sense that men have more time to work on their sexual market value than women do. Um, as a woman who raised her sexual market value, obviously I was a little bit out of shape. I was unhealthy. I didn't have particularly good social skills. I went to the strip club. I got into shape. I practiced my social skills. I talked to lots of people. I became attractive. Um, believe it or no, 10 years ago, I was younger and prettier, but yes, that's what I did. Um, women can raise their sexual value, the sexual market value by getting into shape, by exercising regularly, by making themselves healthy by, you know, by trying to be more attractive, by grooming themselves well. Um, if you smell bad, nobody's going to want to date you. Um, by developing better manners and better social skills. Like, these are things that people can do. You can improve yourself. Option one, if you have a low sexual market value, improve yourself. Um, but what if you don't want to do that? Well, there's always option two. Um, and the potential option three, which is the MGTOW option, which not all MGTOW guys are doing this, but there are a lot of guys who do this who are, you know, they take the MGTOW. Um, well, I just don't want to try anymore. Screw it. It's not worth it. Um, there are some guys who are like, I'm, I'm stepping away from women for a while so that I can do life stuff. I can improve me. I can make me a better man. I, I can serve my own interests. Um, and that's that's cool. But I'm talking about the other MGTOW guys who are like, you know, fuck this shit. I don't want to even play the game. Um, you can do that. Or you can do the, the third option, which is one of the two main options that you're going to see in the sexual marketplace. The person who was of a low sexual market value, who raised their sexual market value. Um, like me, I did that. Or the person who resorts to trickery and deception. And I think that the feminine imperative is women of low sexual market value who are resorting to trickery uh, manipulation of the law, lying, deception, to get what they want, to optimize their own hypergamy. The women who marry some beta chump but get pregnant with some hot alpha dude, but pass that kid off as the beta chump's kid so that they can raise those excellent genes, which I'm not even going to get into that. I could, I could bitch about that for a long time. Um, 
it's trickery. It's, it's deception. You didn't have the sexual market value to warrant that hot alpha dude all by yourself. But since men are somewhat polygynous, he's willing to have sex with you, just not necessarily to stick around afterwards. So you, you seize up some guy who's closer to your own sexual market value and settle for him instead. It's, it's, it's trickery. It's deception. It's lies. It's, it's the sneaky female versus the sneaky male, which is the, the blue-pilled white knight, um, you know, just friend, you know, best friend kind of guy who follows a pretty woman around and tries to suck up to her all the time to, to win and curry her favor so that maybe she'll have a moment of weakness and have sex with him. Um, you know, trickery and deception. Nobody likes it. Nobody appreciates it, but it happens. And it happens on both sides of the fence. I think the current structure of society enables women more in trickery and deception. And I think that also the age differences um, at which men and women peak sexually um, affects that as well. It makes a lot of sense that men, especially especially young men these days who are like kind of screwed when it comes to the sexual marketplace. It's like crap, you know, it's, it's a jungle out there and it's really not nice. And then everybody's looking at them and patting them on the head saying, just improve yourself. And that's got to be frustrating as hell. But at the same time, if you're a very young man and you're just encountering this, you do actually have time to improve yourself before you hit your sexual market peak. Whereas women, if they don't capitalize on that first, you know, first five years of their 20s and really make it worth something and develop themselves as people and seek out an ev- you know a, a good you know prospective mate and really really apply themselves to those goals and make themselves sexually valuable and by sexually valuable I don't just mean hot I mean attractive as a person like attractive in all areas that you possibly can make yourself somebody that somebody attractive to you would want to be with if they don't do that you know suddenly they start hitting the wall they start running out of time they start they start finding out that oh gosh you know I'm 35 now and I can't find a husband and you know I've been partying and having fun and so I haven't really been developing myself as a person and I haven't been making myself particularly attractive and you know, what, what is there that is left to me now that my sexual market value is declining and I haven't done anything to fortify it or capitalize upon it? Well, you, you resort to trickery. When enough women, through cultural forces or personal circumstance, can't capitalize upon what they think is their due, optimal, hypergamic male option, then society must be acculturated to believe that women past their wall expiration date can and should be just as desirable as those in their prime. And so I think that the negative aspects of feminism come from either l- women with low sexual market value who are unattractive to men to begin with, which is something that a lot of people comment on about feminists, or women who have, who have, who they miss the bus, they miss the train as it was going off. And so now all of a sudden they're like playing catch up and they're trying to attract a mate. And so they're making up all these stupid rules like, oh, women in their forties are just as sexy as women in their twenties, which somehow like does anyone actually really believe that like really really god no um it's it's people with low sexual market value if you are a a woman with high sexual market value you might believe these things because you've been told these things and these things have been preached at you a lot but other than that, you're not going to necessarily have any reason to think these things. You're not going to have any reason to resort to trickery because you have a high sexual market value. If you're a woman who started off with a somewhat low sexual market value and you started working to improve yourself, to get into shape, to make yourself physically, you know, visually attractive to men, to learn how to talk to men and flirt with men, um, if you go out seeking a mate, not necessarily in a promiscuous manner, but in a very... Um, goal-oriented kind of manner in a, in a monogamously goal-oriented sort of manner. So like a lot of young Christian girls, I think, I think it gets rough for them because we, number one, we live in a society where everybody expects you to be having sex. So what the hell are you doing? 
But also, like, if you don't go out actively seeking a mate, no one's going to come up to you and find you. Like, they don't... And maybe that, that, maybe that was just me. Maybe that was just the place that I grew up in. But it seems to me that um, you kind of have to go out there into the world, as they say, put yourself out there, and seek out partners. You can't just expect them to plop into your lap and be magically very attractive and magically very hypergamously appealing you have to put in the effort you have to go out you have to socialize you have to meet people you have to try to find someone and i think i i think that a lot of the the feminine imperative comes from people who who failed to do that and so now they're resorting to trickery and I think that's what the feminine imperative is. It is. It's the trickery of women with low sexual market value who are trying to attain what women of high sexual market value would naturally be attaining otherwise. Which is one of the reasons I kind of, I kind of hate it. You know? I, I don't like lies. I don't like deception. I don't like trickery. And I really don't like the idea that women who aren't deserving of good men are stealing good men from women who are deserving of good men. And you might be thinking, oh, well, that's awfully shallow. Like, you know, just because somebody's born with good genetics and they look pretty, that doesn't necessarily mean they deserve something. And I don't think it's that simple. You know, I worked very hard to make myself attractive to men. Not necessarily in the, in the I earned a doctorate because that's what I was told to do. I figured out what men like and I tried to become that thing so that I could be appealing to a potential mate when I found one. And when I found one, I got to keep him. And I've, I've dated men who have been with women who were, you know, not, you know, pretty, but you just rotten inside, horrible people. And it, it, it tarnishes them. It scars them. It really makes them, you know, much less trusting, much less, kind to women subsequent to those first horrible women that they've met and it's the same thing you know just because you're just because you're pretty doesn't give you an automatic high sexual market value it may raise your sexual market value but a human being is is more than just a pretty face if you're pretty and you're crazy and you're mean and you're sadistic you know guys aren't necessarily going to want to be with you even if you have a pretty face you know there's some there's some poor you know cowed and beaten beta male that you might be able to attract but again he's not got a very high sexual market value either um and so that was the thing that I kept thinking about while I was reading this it's like because I was I I don't want to give the Naywalt argument but I was thinking to myself not all women (laughs) I hate to do this. I hate to end on a Naywalt argument, but I was thinking that to myself. I was thinking not all women are are following this this feminine imperative. Um, let's just take, take, take from men kind of attitude. I know too many really good loyal housewives because I've had to I've had to integrate myself out into society, and so now I'm meeting all these women. Um, I've known too many of them who don't follow these patterns. But they're very, they're very attractive women who, who managed to, to gain access to very attractive mates who were hypergamously pleasing to them and they have very stable marriages. And it's like when you play the game right and you win the game and for a woman winning the game is finding a hypergamously appealing male, which I won the game. I I feel great about that. It's like, it's like winning the lottery. Um, only I worked for it, (laughs) but, uh, when women do that, all of a sudden these, these ideas of, you know, we need to take it all from men and men are just scumbags and, you know, men are evil. And so we need to just take, 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 um, those ideas begin to dissolve because we don't need to resort to trickery to achieve what we, what we want in life. It's there. We have it. We want it. You know, 
maybe maybe people don't necessarily with ha- necessarily agree with how we want it. We want it by being beautiful, and we want it by being charming, and we want it by being attractive in many you know many different levels of who we are in many different ways. But we all won the prize. So yeah, that's what I that's what I thought of while I was reading this chapter. This idea that it's not just women, the feminine imperative, the destructive nature of it. It's not. I, I don't think it's just women. I think it's too simplistic to look at it and say that it's it's women who are who are causing this destruction. I think I think a lot of women are brainwashed. I think a lot of women are blue pilled, just like men are blue pilled. Um, I think it would be very good to shake women out of that blue pilled conditioning because it's not good for them any more than it is for men. But I think that a lot of the the grotesque aspects of the feminine imperative that Tomasi describes in this chapter are really the tricks and games and deceptions of women, but sometimes men, who have a low sexual market value, who are attempting to to gain what they want in the sexual marketplace, you know, without really earning it, without working to improve themselves, without putting any effort forth, or after having wasted the first 10 years of their dating period, this, you know, those, those, those precious 10 years in their 20s, um, having not used those productively, suddenly they have to resort to trickery in order to get what they want. I think that this is a product of the, the bitterness and the unwillingness to change. Particularly in women, sometimes in men that occurs in the sexual marketplace. I think these people have found a voice, many voices. It's not, it's not, it's not a conspiracy. Um, but many of these people have become very vocal about what they want and what they feel they're entitled to. And I think it's a lot of trickery and deception. I think that women who are of high sexual market value, who manage to obtain hypergamously appealing mates aren't playing these games as much. I mean, some of them obviously get brainwashed. Some of them are very blue-pilled. Um, but I don't think it's a man versus woman thing. I think it's a, a low sexual market value plus unwillingness to change or grow or develop yourself versus a high sexual market value or low sexual market value, but a a determination to change and improve. I think it's those two versus, you know, low and unwilling to improve. Um, But that was the impression that I got from this chapter. Like, that was the thing that really just kept resounding with me as I read it. Um, So that's, that's what I, that's what I think. That's what I kept on thinking as I was reading this. Um... And that's kind of, that's kind of the end of it. That's the end of the book. That's the, that's the final thought on uh, Rolla Tomasi's book, The Rational Male. <laughs> um, it's still weird to me that I'm finishing this book. Like it's been a lot of time. Anyway, um, next week, you guys have asked me some fantastic questions and I really, really want to answer them. And I want to do a video talking about them. Um, one of you asked a question for my husband and so I'm going to try and get his answer and either have him read it or I'll write it down and I'll read it to you guys. Um, and then, yeah, then the week after this week or the week after next week, we'll be beginning, uh, the mystery method. So I, I hope to see you all there and, uh, keep healthy, keep well, be safe, take care of yourselves guys. And, um, I'll talk to y'all later. I would like to thank you all for reviewing The Rational Mail with me. It's a fantastic book, and if you haven't already read it, I highly recommend checking it out.